Welcome to Thinking Like a Lawyer with your hosts, Ellie Mistal and Joe Patrice, talking about legal news and pop culture, all while thinking like a lawyer, here on Legal Talk Network. Hello, welcome to Thinking Like a Lawyer. I'm Joe Patrice, uh, coming to you live from the uh, pandemic fallout shelter that we have moved above the law headquarters into in an undisclosed location. Today is kind of a fun day for us, even though we're coming from a remote place, we're going to be able to go back to a classic episode of Thinking Like a Lawyer, uh, in that we, I think it was was potentially our first interview episode ever of this show. So several going back several years, we interviewed this guest, and now we're going to catch up on what's happened in between. So I want to bring back to the show uh, Ryan Morrison. He's at uh, Morrison Rothman. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. He's also known to most of the world as video game attorney online, and that's uh, the niche practice that he's really taken and run with. And so... How you well before we get into the particulars of the industry? So you're also at home, I assume. I, I am. This has been uh, quite the quite a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it's it's interesting. So we, I'll just ask the question for somebody who's practicing: What is this whole increasingly severe? lockdown like for you all? I mean, it's not that the law is really stopping. I mean, I guess some courts are suspending, but um, issues are continuing to arise. Uh, How have you been coping with running a firm from remote? So we actually are in a lucky position because we have a lot of attorneys here who are on the younger side and understand the technology behind everything. Uh, As many big firms and as many of our clients are figuring out things like Zoom or Discord or things like that, we've already been running our firm through them. Uh, Yes, we have an office in Los Angeles and that's currently closed. We have about 10 people there and and they're all working from home now. But we've always, and you know, every day we have remote attorneys. We have one in Connecticut, one in Virginia. We have people all over the place. Uh, So we are used to a, a weekly all hands through Zoom and talking through Discord and making sure everyone's same page. So our day-to-day operations are not so disrupted other than uh, we're going stir crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I could imagine. Uh, yeah, it's we've been hearing reports from some of the giant big law firms of how they're dealing with it, but you know, we haven't checked in as much on smaller firms and in some ways the smaller firms are you know have that increased nimbleness to uh, to do what you're uh, what you're doing. Yeah, in fact, I think we're we're you know this is kind of a good position for us, all things considered. Obviously, it's a terrible position for the world, the country, and and just humans at large. Uh, but business wise, we are able to pivot a lot more quickly than these big firms. Uh, we're we're able to change our entire business practice overnight as long as myself and my two partners agree, and we put in a new plan, and uh, it allows for us to keep the clients happy. Uh, since we last spoken, we've been working with far larger clients, a lot of AAA studios, a lot of technology companies, mm-hmm. which I'm sure we'll talk about a bit later. Yeah. Uh, but they're calling us and saying, we don't know how to work remote. Can you do it for us? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so it's been an interesting month for sure. Wow. Well, we'll take this opportunity to thank our sponsor. So today's episode is brought to you by your beehive, which is very mad at you because you're still at the office slogging through an endless doc review project. Make better decisions, keep your pet, and work smarter with Logical, e-discovery software that gets you started in minutes. Don't let frustrating, outdated e-discovery sting you. Create your free account today at logiccol.com forward slash ATL. That's logic with a K, C-U-L-L dot com forward slash ATL. ATL. And yes, I went to bees there as pets because I'm starting to run out of new ones to come up with. Uh, (laughs) If people have suggestions for animals I have not yet used, uh, let me know. So I really do think it was the probably the second episode. I think we had an introductory episode and then the first real episode of this show uh, we had you on. And at the time, I had just met you. You were pretty much fresh out of law school, I think, Uh, maybe you'd been out a year, and you had decided to go into this practice that you you saw a need for someone, and it was an area that you loved and understood, and you were like, I'm going to be a video game attorney. And at the time, you were just kind of doing your own thing. Now, 
what's happened in the years interview. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's been an honor to have been one of the earlier guests for sure. If not the first, that would, that's I amazing. I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you guys were great. And it was, a, it was truly a, a fun experience. And yeah, I mean, to that point, I, everyone in, in my life personally, professionally, and in between told me, do not start a law firm out of law school. Uh, <laughs> that's, you know, that's, you don't know what you don't know, et cetera. Uh, and they were absolutely right. I mean, I was very blessed to have great attorneys around me that I was able to use as a mentor network. Uh, but if you remember back then, or for those who don't know, uh, the way I got into this was uh, Candy Crush, which was on everyone's phone. Their parent company or the, the company that owns them, King, was going around claiming ownership of the trademarks for Candy and Saga and s- not suing people, but shutting down a lot of companies or, or sending demand letters. And Reddit went nuts. And they were everybody was saying, we want an attorney, but we can't afford one. So I went online and I said, listen, I've been a lawyer for about eight days, but I'll help you for free if you want to do this. And it steamrolled and snowballed. It it turned into a lot of successes on our end. Reddit started calling me video game attorney. Uh, I ran with it, got a Twitter following out of it. And all of a sudden I had a law firm. So I I partnered with attorneys smarter than me and and, uh, hired people smarter than me. And we've... uh, We've built something really cool here. It's been seven years now. My partner, Allison Rothman, who's the Rothman of Morrison Rothman, uh, she started as an associate with us, but like I said, was was not only smarter, but also just knew everything we needed, worked her, her butt off. And, and uh, as we joked before this podcast started, every time I, I do a podcast like this, she says, please don't ruin the firm. Uh, so she's the level-headed one. Uh, and then I partnered with Keith Cooper, who's been practicing 25 years. He comes from traditional entertainment, uh, music, uh, movies, film, TV, et cetera. So though, and, and Allie comes from brand protection for luxury goods. She was working with brands like Louis Vuitton and Rolex. So those are three very different mindsets, three very different backgrounds. Uh, and it allowed us to, to sit at a table together and really brainstorm how to not only make what we had sustainable and work and grow, but also build towards the AAA studios, the the big publishers we want to work with, uh, technology companies throughout San Francisco and LA. Uh, It's a big reason I moved to the West Coast. I miss the pizza and the people of New York, but (laughs) there's not my, our industry is not there. Uh, So it's, it's been a ride though. And, and, uh, you know, very exciting to see where it's all still going. We're about 10 attorneys strong right now. And, and we hired uh, specialists. We tried not to hire any generalists. We hired people who had a really strong passion for, let's say, intellectual property or let's say privacy, whatever it might be, that we were seeing a lot of problems come in from our clients. And it's been, a, it's been a lot of trial and error. We've had turnover for sure. I've put a lot of energy and resources into very, let's just be blunt, stupid endeavors. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it is a very small industry of attorneys who can say truly they work in video games, esports, and digital entertainment. And I really believe our firm is at the forefront of that. Uh, so we're in a, and not to say that there are not other firms absolutely killing it in the space, uh, but we're in a good place and we, we look to stay there and, and build this as we grow. You know, you mentioned esports there. I will just say uh, when I was in a bar, you know, back when we had bars, uh, so about a week ago, <laughs> uh, and there were no sports on TV, and somebody said, What are we going to do without sports? And I said, Without hesitation, I think what's going to happen is we're all going to have some very strong opinions about Fortnite pretty soon, uh, which I assumed would take over. <laughs> yeah, listen, you're not wrong. Uh, not only is esports, you know, the, the live events are canceled, sure, but there are events going on every day on Twitch and others uh, that you can go see. But not only that, professional athletes who are now immensely bored <laughs> are going to esports. We have a lot of NBA players reaching out to my firm or to my, I also have a talent agency that works in the space. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, the NBA players are contacting us. We just saw a headline this morning that the NASCAR drivers are starting sim racing from their homes uh, oh, and yeah. streaming it on Twitch. So there will be sports. It's just definitely not the kind most people listening to this are are used to. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that, and, you know, for the racers that you know, like the the higher end ones, I know they have super high tech sim system. So that's something that they're already set up in their homes to do. So that makes sense. Yeah. If you're not driving Google, what those look like, they are incredible. Yeah. Like they, like it's like a whole, it's like the cockpit out of it is just <laughs> on the crazy. Yeah. It looks out of a sci-fi movie. It's crazy. 
Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned uh, you brought in IP people and privacy people, the, the issues, specialists in the issues that your clients started seeing. So let's talk about the privacy one for now. So what's going on with, and what in this industry when it comes to privacy? I mean, we've had kind of sea changes in privacy laws around us, and we've talked about it from a bunch of different angles, but we've never really focused on how it impacts video gaming. Yeah, and it's it's crazy to just look at it as a whole. So we do a ton of work in privacy right now. Uh, as each country, continent, state comes out with new privacy laws, the companies that are targets, the bigger companies that might get hit by it, are, are rightfully so confused, scared, and don't know which end is up. Uh, we like to think we offer a solution there by walking them through all of it. However, looking at it even a step back, for 20 years, everyone with a computer and the internet was giving away their privacy in exchange for nothing. It's the terms of service and privacy policy that you can't click OK fast enough on at the beginning of a, a website. We all agree to that. Courts have said they, they hold up. They're legitimate. There was a stat recently that said if you took the time to read every privacy policy you agree to in one day, it would take seven days. So it, I don't know why they hold up in court, but because it, it, it's quite literally impossible to read them. However, you have to, they're the law. And for 20 years, again, we did that. Then people started caring all of a sudden, but only on a surface level. They don't actually care. They just say they care. And then the GDPR comes out in Europe, CCPA in California, all of these very complicated laws that require extreme compliance. And all they've turned into was an email from every company you work with that everyone had to get on January 1st. And now we, we all get uh, a pop-up at the bottom of our, of our website saying, we use cookies, is that okay, blah, blah, blah. And everyone just clicks that, okay, 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 I want to go to the website. So it, yeah. it's kind of silly to think that this is solving anything, but it is, uh, you know, it's absolutely the reality. And it's insanely complicated. If you don't have a privacy attorney, uh, I would get one if you are a, a legitimate company worried about a finer profits. Yeah. And for some of us uh, who think back to video games being, oh, you know, I get my cartridge and put it in and then that's the end of the conversation. But that's just not where games are these days. It's And and not to even jump in there. I'm sorry. I, you got yeah, me no, excited. I mean, but... You knew where I was going. <laughs> yeah. Because listen, you don't own anything you own, quote unquote, anymore. Uh, yeah. So the privacy laws aside, I mean, that's all about what is the game tracking from you? And it's everything. If you if you track an email address, you need to be compliant under these privacy laws. That's why it's not even games is still our, our shtick, but we, you know, we're doing compliance for jewelry stores. It's things that you would never think that need to do this that we're doing it for. But with video games in particular, yeah, they track everything. They know how long you wait at the start screen before you hit play. They know what character you click uh, and then don't play, but they know what you're considering. They know how much you're spending in the store versus your friend who doesn't spend. And then when there's random drops, they'll give your friend who doesn't spend money all the free cool items so that he's a walking billboard for you who's playing next to him that will spend the money. Uh, the mm -hmm. privacy stuff gets absolutely crazy. And to your point, all this stuff you eventually spend money on, you don't own. Whether it is you know the new Halo game or new whatever game that you're, you're downloading off, X, off your Xbox or PlayStation or computer, all you're actually downloading is a license to play that game. And that license is wholly revocable if they catch you cheating or selling the account or if they just want to. They can do it at their whim. Uh, and, and this counts even if you go... I, I had a friend who said, oh, well, that doesn't apply to me. I go into GameStop and I buy the disc and then I go home and, and put it in my Xbox. No, it's the same thing because all that disc does now is unlock the download. You do not own anything anymore. There's no used sale. It, it was so fun when we were kids, right? To go in there and find the dollar used games and things like that. Mm -hmm. Never again. That doesn't exist anymore. So that's where we are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, at least never again without somebody making a comprehensive change to the intellectual property laws, which, I mean, uh, who knows? But I, I think the real, the moment Half where Half our government believes yeah. in angels, so I wouldn't hold your right. breath. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I've always said that the time when that's going to come is when people start seeing that the hundreds and hundreds of dollars they've spent on iTunes, all that music just disappears because, oh, you didn't really own it. I think that's yeah. the moment it'll finally hit people, what happened. Absolutely. And that's why services like Spotify are, became so popular because, first off, why am I buying a track? And then what do you mean I don't own the account? What do you mean I can't give this to my son? 
Uh, you're yeah. not allowed to leave your Steam library with all your games in there to your family if you die. They just it disappears. That's insane. But that's the current <laughs> law. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> wow now i don't think they'd go after you to be fair steam i don't think steam is evil but uh <laughs> but the law says that that's what their terms of service says you cannot give this away wow so what other big issues are you seeing legally uh, in in this space uh I mean, we talked about privacy and uh, we've kind of touched on some ip stuff but if you were to define like the big issues we haven't yet touched on in this space what would they be uh, there are there are a few, and I'll jump right into them. I would say because I, I know a lot of law students listen to this. Also, yeah. uh, if if there is a way to stand out right now, it is absolutely mastering privacy. Uh, everyone is concerned about it. Like I said, jewelry stores to video games, everyone has to comply here. Uh, and there are so many law students who say, "Oh, I'm interested in privacy," or they have it on their resume. But when you get them in an interview, they don't actually know anything, and that's fine. I, they're law students, but if you are a student looking for work. There is no better advice than, than absolutely master privacy right now. That said, the other stuff that we're working on that is, is generating a ton of uh, concern for our clients is, uh, strangely enough, accessibility. Uh, accessibility laws are in place for very good reasons, for people who need the same or similar access to all of the things that you and I enjoy, enjoy and they should have that right. However, as with most laws, there are terrible people and terrible attorneys out there who take advantage of it. Uh, so there is a, a few law firms in particular, I won't name them to save you a defamation suit, but I'll tweet about it later, uh, who are <laughs> going around and filing what I would call troll lawsuits. They found one handicapped individual, if or he even exists, and they go after video games, very small indie games, saying, hey, you don't have this, this, or that. Send us fifty thousand dollars and and an admission that you take this seriously and you're moving forward. And all they're doing is building up. Look how many people have done this before you for their next demand letter. Uh, and it's it's absolutely ridiculous. It's putting in things like e-readers or text speech or or things that again are very necessary in some instances, but are not necessary in an indie game about you know moving left to right and hitting a block with a sword. Uh, yeah. You know there, there's. So we're seeing a lot of that. Accessibility lawsuits are, are all over the place. Uh, and then most importantly, as I'm sure you've talked about on here before, or, or you've just seen in various news articles, is the DMCA. As everyone's currently quarantined and sitting home watching YouTube and Twitch and getting their news online and everything else, everybody wants to be the first one out. You know, we want to make sure my video is the first, my video is the, if it's first, it's the best. It doesn't matter if it's actually the best. And as a result, we're seeing so many fraudulent DMCAs sent out by people who know that the process of a DMCA, which is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, you can send a takedown. So you go to a YouTube video who's a competitor to you, and you issue a fraudulent takedown on their video that beat you to market. Or if you're you know, a, a journalist, you do it to a, a rival journalist on their article, that goes down. And the, the appeal process takes a few days, if not a few weeks. So by the time it gets up, nobody cares anymore. No one's reading or watching that. And you've become in first place. Now that's perjury. Submitting a, a, a fraudulent DMCA is straight up perjury. However, it's happening wildly throughout the internet. I mean, it, it, it's almost like it's happening automatically as though, they, as though no one's even looking at it before they file their DMCA requests. Right. And they, yeah. ha I mean, there's a Supreme Court case. They have to, but they yeah. do not. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, it, speaking of that, uh, you know, the videos and so on, we mentioned Twitch already. When that first started, I thought that was a super cool service. And I worried that it was going to become bogged down in people saying, well, you can't show what you're showing because I have some IP. It seems as though there's been a kind of an, a, a settling of all that where people aren't aren't upset about Twitch anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. So, and for those who don't know, Twitch it does other things. It has poker, it has sports, it has live events. Bernie Sanders did his rally on there, but it is at at its heart a video game website. And yeah, there's been a lot of talk about: Are you allowed to stream a game on there? Is it transformative? Yeah. Is it fair use, or is this just straight up infringement? And I think legal scholars as a whole kind of agree, yeah, it's straight up infringement. However, <laughs> uh, you know, I would argue there's a lot of fair use or transformative elements there that are worth discussing. However, you know, that's nothing to hang your hat on as, as a, a business person starting a stream. But you're right. Most companies have said, why on earth would we fight this? This is a great thing for us. Look how many people are watching our game. 
However, we're seeing more competitors come out. We just saw Blizzard Activision, who makes World of Warcraft, Hearthstone, Call of Duty, Overwatch, uh, some really big titles. We saw them leave Twitch and go to YouTube gaming. So now that's a huge, huge, huge uh, situation there. Uh, we also saw developers in the past, uh, Nintendo, for example, tried to say, anyone who wants to stream Nintendo games, go ahead, but we want a cut of it. They got lit on fire for that, so that very quickly went away. And then even more recently, the game Persona 5 came out, and they said, you're allowed to stream this, but since it's a story game and we don't want people to ruin the plot so they, they don't buy it, you can only stream up to this hour in the game, and then you have to stop. No one listened to that, and everyone lit them on fire, and they also retracted it. So you just can't beat the public on this. Okay, that's good to know. But, uh, you know, that course, that progression you were describing is the same sort of progression that streaming video had. At first, everybody was willing to put their things, you know, license out to Netflix because everyone's getting to see our movies. And then suddenly somebody said, well, if we started our own service and now you're paying eight different subscriptions. And it's the same people. I mean, Fox yeah. is the one who's behind uh, one of the Twitch's competitors. Microsoft's another one. That said, I, and maybe I'm being naive here and, and I'm becoming a dinosaur in the industry, but uh, <laughs> you know, I've prided myself on being the, the, the guy who really gets this stuff. I am a nerd at heart. Uh, I don't think anybody beats Twitch. I think Twitch is it's such a strong position right now that competing with it is, is foolhardy. Kids don't watch TV. We, uh, my generation was the cord cutting generation. Their generation never had cords. They don't know what cable is. So they went on and they watched Twitch. And when yeah. you know Ninja was the biggest guy on Twitch, he left to go to a rival uh, service, Mixer, and the numbers are out. His, his audience did not follow. And that's because when kids are watching Twitch, that's their TV. There's an infinite number of channels on it. If your favorite show gets canceled, you don't just throw out your TV. You find another show. And that's what they did. They found other streamers, uh, many of whom we represent. So thank you, Ninja. That was great. Uh, and we are, uh, you know, we're seeing extreme success for some of our guys uh, and extreme growth for some of our guys because all these kids needed a new thing to watch. And, and wow. it's been, I, I think, as they grow and as they become, you know, my age and then their kids, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we're in a place where, where there is room for competitors. I think Mixer will do well. It's not like Ninja's not doing well. Uh, but I think that Twitch is, is at the heart of entertainment in a lot of ways for the next decade or so. What is the the occupation of a streamer like there? Like what, what when you're representing these folks, what are what are they doing? I assume it's sponsorships and stuff like that. Uh, that's just a world that's foreign to a lot of folks. So oh yeah, it's it's. I mean, they make more money than you can comprehend. Honestly, <laughs> it, it is because uh, there are so many revenue streams. So yes, we're we're constantly doing six figure deals, seven figure deals sometimes for these streamers for them just to hold up a product and say, hey, buy this because they have such so many followers and so many die hard fans that do what they say that a year long campaign for somebody is worth that kind of money to them. They used to spend $10 million on a Super Bowl commercial, right? So for a sliver of that, you get more eyeballs and more consistent eyeballs with, with die hard supporters of your brand. It's a no brainer choice. So wow. brand, brands are starting to figure that out and come here. Now that said, that's one avenue. The other is if you watch one of these streams, they're free to watch. However, you can subscribe for $5 a month up to $50 a month, and that gives you different perks. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, the perks are as simple as you get to chat in the chat room, and sometimes the streamer will say hi to you. Uh, other times they'll send you a t-shirt, whatever it might be. There's different levels, and they get the lion's share of that split of when people sign up and subscribe to them. So if someone has half a million subscribers at $5 a month each, you can do the math there. It's insane. Now, that's, again, only one. There's The other thing is people watching these streams just straight up donate money. They just click a button saying, have $20. There's no perk. There's nothing in return. It's just, oh, my God, please say my name. I, I gave you $20. Can you give me a shout out? And that's all it is. But that is constant and rampant. Wow. Yeah. yeah. No, we chose the wrong profession, my friend. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Um, 
obviously this podcast is a lot like that uh it just <laughs> oh oh yeah i mean it's just it, you know several you hundred thousand me less. up in your uh, jet this morning by the way <laughs> <laughs> wow no so it that's fascinating and yeah and i assume that that's you represent them more as part of the talent agency part of your business yeah so the talent agency uh is is actually a totally separate business it, it's all the same overlap of of clients and industry but it's different partners different staff different everything and yeah, oh, they wow. represent a ton of uh, esports players. We represent the top players in most games. We represent a, t- a ton of streamers. But like Allison and Keith, who I mentioned earlier at the law firm, they have nothing to do with the agency other than uh, legal oh, okay. work for it here and there. Yeah, it's it's been pretty exciting. Same way over there. Once we started helping these these kids as lawyers, and they're not kids, you know, they're they're eighteen to twenty six. Once we right. started helping them as lawyers, they said, "Hey." That was awesome. You got me paid. That's awesome. You figured out this contract or helped me with this dispute. But can you negotiate the next one? Can you find me a sponsor? And very mm-hmm. quickly, we realized I can, but I need to get a talent agency license and I need to figure out a new business model. So yeah, I, I don't sleep. I have those two different businesses. Wow. <laughs> no, that that's that's incredible. And again, all of this is from the first time we talked till now. Uh, you were just beginning to figure out how to you know, get bills paid basically the last time we talked. <laughs> last time we spoke, I was in a bedroom, uh, not because of, of a pandemic. It's because I had no company yet. I was, yeah. you know, I, I saw a lot of success early on, but keep in mind, I didn't charge anybody anything. I, I was working for free for two years, uh, all but living on a friend's couch until this really started to, to turn into something. And when I became comfortable with what, what I was doing without outsourcing it or without calling a mentor, you know, that's when we turned it into a business. Like I said, about, you know, five, six years ago, nowadays with the people who work here and just what I've personally touched, I don't think there's anything in digital entertainment we have not worked on and worked on quite a bit. So we have giant big law firms calling us constantly to co-counsel or advise on matters that have been brought to them, uh, which is always frustrating because I know how much they're upcharging our work. Uh, But, you know, fair enough. I I wish they would call us direct sometimes, but that's happening more and more too. I mean, as you Google around in the space, you see how much we've done and where our victories are. And it's, it's, uh, we try to be the good guys, you know, even the video game attorney stuff. When I started the other attorneys in the space working in digital entertainment were upset by that, of course. But, uh, I actually flew out to the guy who was known as quote unquote game attorney, uh, in Seattle. And I asked him if it was okay if I changed my Twitter handle to that. And that's all I've ever done. I don't put yeah. it anywhere else, uh, but it's fun and people, you know, use it here and there. But, you know, I'm a video game attorney, not the video game right. attorney. And uh, it's, a, it's a great industry of really smart people. It's a small industry. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it growing. When we first talked, no one knew what video game law was. Now I'm not exaggerating when I tell you we get 100 resumes a month. Now, and I remember... A few years before we first talked, uh, I remember that one of the big banks, I, I'm, I'm out here in New York, obviously, so I interact, interact with that world a lot. One of the big banks finally opened a desk uh, to do research on the video game companies, and everyone thought, what a crazy little thing. And the response was, you understand this is bigger than all but one or two of the film industry that we <laughs> have been covering for years. Why haven't we been covering this? And I was like, wow, that's a sign of how weirdly this industry, even as it was getting huge, was viewed as something of a sideshow when it really was becoming a, a big, big business. And it still is. I mean, currently video games make more than music, movies, and TV combined. That's insane. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but If you go ask a a traditional entertainment attorney, what do they think of the video game space? They usually laugh it off as that's fake law or that's a fad. Uh, Most of the co-counsel, not co-counsel, most of the opposing counsel we deal with are doing so begrudgingly because they don't understand why is my movie star client signing into this game? And when we're negotiating the deal on the other side, uh, we get everything we want. It's insane. The the test for if your attorney knows this space is uh, we call it the test. Because if they call it the Facebook or the Twitch or the inter- you know, they just, that means they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a fair test. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah. No, I mean, and that's been true forever. I, I absolutely remember old people referring to the TV. So <laughs> yeah. are you so, a, a gamer yourself? So not hugely, but I mean, I, I have systems and play, but I've not been, as I've gotten older, I've been not as aggressive about it. I was always more into the strategy. So I was the sort of person who would play Civilization for 
12, 13, 14 straight hours. Uh, <laughs> Now's back. a good time to do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that, those were the kind of games that I was into when I used to play a ton. Uh, I actually am still slowly and surely, and I know this game's got to be like four years old now. I'm slowly and surely working my way through Witcher 3. So I have that. That, that is an amazing game by an amazing studio and that is a good choice <laughs> yeah it, it, it's great but i mean i don't have a ton of time but i am slowly i'm getting close to the end i'm pretty sure but i mean by end i mean of the story not of the eight thousand side quests that are in there. <laughs> that's right and then you can watch the netflix show when you're done which i i have watched the netflix show. that's actually what got me doing it again i had i had been off of it for a couple of months and then i watched the show and went oh you know i got it. i should get back to churning through that <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 nice to say part of my job is playing games sometimes, but yeah. uh, but back to those resumes we're getting all the time. Yeah. it's not the whole job. Uh, right. you know, we work we work very long hours and very hard here, and it's uh it's funny when you get the intern who's like, oh yeah, I love Sonic, I just want to come there and play games all day. Well, that you're obviously not <laughs> looking right. at reality here. <laughs> <laughs> Drafting so privacy policies, fun is not <laughs> right. So what uh, what's the game you're looking forward to next? Uh, the, the Final Fantasy VII remake that's coming out soon, uh, because okay. I, I am the I'm the reason the entertainment industry broke. Uh, <laughs> I, I am I am nostalgia. I want to go see the reboot. I don't care. You know, I'm the reason Hollywood stopped making new ideas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very enough. excited for that remake. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, great to check in with you. We will, uh, you know, I'll, we should check in with you more often than uh, from the beginning to the to this point in your career. So we'll uh, we'll chat again sometime soon. But thanks for joining us today from your pandemic uh, bunker. <laughs> My absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me again. And, and yeah, always always happy to talk some games. Absolutely. Well, so, and thank you all for listening. You should be subscribed to the show. You should be giving it stars and reviews, all those things. You should be listening to all the other shows from the Not Legal just Talk. stars, five stars only. Right. Five, good point. Good point. <laughs> five stars only. And write something because uh, people know that five star, the algorithm knows that five stars is easy. Actually, writing words is hard, so they give that a, that actually gets a little bit of an extra boost. Uh, you should be listening to all the other shows of the Legal Talk Network. Uh, you should listen to the Jabot, which is the Catherine Rubino show. You should be reading above the law. You should follow. I'm at Joseph Patrice. You're at Video Game Attorney, right? Or is it? I'm actually just at Morrison right now, which ah. is very difficult when the Prime Minister of Australia is an evil man with the same name. <laughs> I, I Why are all these fires all happening? Day. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> At Morrison on Twitter, that's me. <laughs> okay, and uh, and yeah, then we will uh, talk to you uh, next week. Until then, see everybody later. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. You can also find us at AboveTheLaw.com, ATLRedline.com, iTunes, RSS, Twitter, and Facebook. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.